Today, we're going to be talking about authoritarianism and some of the techniques of authoritarian regimes that they use while they're in power, using Nazi Germany as an example. The main techniques of authoritarian regimes we're going to talk about here are rule by an elite, scapegoating, indoctrination, the repression of dissidents, controlled participation, and use of force and terror. Adolf Hitler and the Nazis employed all of these to ensure that they had a firm grip on the population of Germany and that their regime and their ideology would succeed. Nazi Germany operated under an ideology called fascism, where they prioritized extreme nationalism and militarism above all else, with a core element of fascism being the rejection of the principles of liberalism. The first technique of authoritarianism that we're going to talk about is rule by an elite. What we mean by rule by an elite is that decisions and laws are made not by the elected representatives that might be chosen by the people in elections, but by a small group and sometimes one individual making laws and decisions for the whole country. In Nazi Germany, this at the very top was Adolf Hitler, um, but he was supported by some of his advisors, such as the Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, and Hitler's right-hand man, Hermann Goering. And they had the ability to make decisions without any checks on their power, right? No judicial branch to make sure that the laws followed their constitution. The elected legislature was completely powerless in Nazi Germany. So it was left up to this executive making all the rules, all the laws for the country. This came about as a result of the Enabling Act that Hitler and the Nazis passed on March 23rd, 1933. And this act basically laid out this legal dictatorship, as it were, in Nazi Germany, where Article 1 of the Enabling Act stated that in addition to the procedure prescribed by the Constitution, laws of the Reich may also be enacted by the Reich government, right? So that means the legislature, the parliament, wasn't the only way laws could be made, but also the laws could come directly from the Reich government, and in this case, the executive of Hitler and his advisors. Article 2 stated that laws enacted by the Reich government may deviate from the Constitution. Right? So these laws that Hitler and the Nazis were now allowed to make could go entirely against the Constitution, and that was now a part of law. So basically at this point, Germany had no Constitution that needed to be followed. The next technique of authoritarianism we're going to talk about is scapegoating. And scapegoating is when you place the blame for all of society's problems on a particular group of people as a way to justify some of your repressive policies. In Nazi Germany, several groups were scapegoated as being some of the reasons for what Hitler claimed was the downfall of the German Empire. The first group he placed blame on were communists. And one of the ways that Nazi Germany became Nazi Germany and Hitler came to power was after an event known as the Reichstag fire. In 1933, a supposed communist lit fire and set fire to the Reichstag building, the German House of Parliament. Hitler blamed this event on all communists and immediately after issued a law called the Reichstag Fire Decree that basically suspended civil liberties in Germany and used it to arrest any communist leaders, communist sympathizers, and lock them up in concentration camps. The other group that was scapegoated in Nazi Germany were the Jews. And one of the big reasons for the scapegoating of the Jews was what was known as the myth of the stab in the back that it was this Jewish conspiracy to bring the end to the strength of Germany. And this came through in the Treaty of Versailles that was pretty universally loathed in Germany. And Hitler and the Nazis used this Treaty of Versailles as a way to blame the Jews for causing it. And 
That obviously escalated into the atrocities of the Holocaust. But by using communists and Jews as a scapegoat, Hitler was able to justify, again, a lot of the really repressive measures that were taken in his regime. The next method of authoritarianism we're going to talk about is indoctrination. And indoctrination is when you are able to convince the population of your country that your vision is the best vision and that all other visions are wrong, basically eliminating critical thinking from society altogether. The big way you do that is through propaganda. And again, Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's minister of propaganda, was tasked with making sure he essentially brainwashed German's population to the fascist ideology and to Nazi policies. One way to do that is through the censorship of the media. If all media is state run, well then the only information getting out there is going to be what the state wants people to hear. Another way is through adapting the education system to basically perpetrate these Nazi ideologies, right? So school curriculums were rewritten to glorify Hitler and the Nazis and to, you know, use Jews as scapegoats and communists as scapegoats as being some of the reasons for Germany's downfall. All of these things were taught in the Nazi school system. And even children's books like The Poisonous Mushroom were written as a way to, you know, show kids of what the Nazis were um, saying about Jews. And some of the things written in these books was absolutely vile and basically was teaching this anti-Semitism, racism to children. Another event that supported this idea of indoctrination was an organized series of book burnings that the Nazis employed. And these were meant to basically strip away ideas that went contrary to Nazi ideology away from society. About one of these book burning days, historian David Cohen writes that on May 10th, Nazi students burned 25,000 un-German books outside of the state opera in Berlin. Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels told the crowds no to decadence and moral corruption, yes to decency and morality in family and state. Then he flung books by Stefan Zweig, Eric Kastner, Freud, and many others into the flames. And thus you do well in this midnight hour to commit to the flames the evil spirit of the past, Goebbels shouted. Right, so this idea of doing away with what the Nazis felt was wrong, a lot of liberal ideology was contained in these books that were burnt. And to Goebbels, this was this evil spirit of the past that needed to be done away with. Another technique of authoritarian regimes is the repression of dissidents. What this one means is that people who are actively disagreeing with what the state wants are going to be repressed. And in Nazi Germany, this came in two different ways. Sort of the more organized dissent coming from other political parties, where in a liberal democratic society, we see that as good. Seeing different perspectives and different opinions out there is important. In Nazi Germany, that was a challenge to the state, which could not be allowed. And so very shortly after Hitler passed the Enabling Act, all other political parties were dissolved. Some just merged into the Nazi party entirely. Some like socialist parties and communist parties, their leaders were arrested. And so the parties themselves effectively ceased to exist. And then Hitler passed a law not allowing the formation of any new parties. So as a result, Nazi Germany became a one party state. Dissent was also crushed through the use of concentration camps and individuals who were protesting Nazi policies, Nazi ideology, or putting forward something that went contrary to those ideas would be arrested and imprisoned in concentration camps. Another authoritarian tactic is what we call controlled participation. And this is one 
where you feel like you're participating in society, that you have a say, that you have some sort of individualistic choice, but really that is still entirely being controlled by the state. One way we see this is through elections that are, well, sham elections, essentially. Right? In the election of November 1933 in Germany, for example, this was the first election held after Nazi party became the only party in Germany. And this election had a 96% voter turnout and 93% of the vote went to the Nazis because, well, they were the only party you could vote for. And the remaining percentage of the votes were either ineligible or um, cast for somebody else, usually in the form of write-in votes. Another form of controlled participation are these mass rallies that the Nazis held as a way to make people feel that they are taking part in the success of the state. So on regular occasions, Hitler would hold these massive rallies, massive parades that were entirely used as propaganda to show how well the Nazi state is doing. And you would go to these and people felt totally immersed, totally part of what was happening and really felt like Adolf Hitler was doing uh, great things for Germany. But again, these were all entirely put on for show and entirely a form of propaganda. Finally, the last technique of authoritarianism that we're going to talk about is the use of force and terror. So in Nazi Germany, the Nazis employed, for example, the Gestapo, who were a secret police that had offices all over German cities and towns where people could basically go and snitch on their neighbors who they felt were doing things against Nazi belief. So for example, if you felt like your neighbors were holding secret meetings or listening to music that was now banned, you could go to the Gestapo and the Gestapo would deal with that. Very often they were arresting members of other political movements and any dissenters would be dealt by the Gestapo. An example of the use of force and terror on a large scale was Kristallnacht, which happened on November 9th, 1938, and translated to English, it's the night of broken glass, where the Nazis all over Germany organized these riots against Jewish businesses and synagogues. So synagogue, Jewish places of worship were burned, Jewish businesses were destroyed, and it gets its name from all the glass that littered the streets after these riots occurred. And again, entirely organized by the Nazis as a way of intimidating the Jewish population in Germany, showing them that they're no longer safe and they needed to be gone because they weren't part of Hitler's vision for what Germany should have looked like. Right, so these are some of the ways that authoritarian systems aim to establish their total control over their societies. And at its heart, it's that rejection of the principles of liberal democracy. And while Nazi Germany is one of the biggest examples of this happening on a large scale, basically ticking all of these boxes of authoritarian techniques, other governments around the world seek ways to undermine democracy as well, not as overtly as places like Nazi Germany, but we still sometimes see it happen. And in a lot of ways, it's our job to call it out when we see it, because even in today's world, some of the things that are happening can be pretty reminiscent of some of the techniques that the Nazis employed in Germany and other authoritarian systems around the world. Democracy is hard, but we have to try our best to make it work because if we don't, the alternatives can be much worse. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again next time.